invite everyone to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, those of you who have been around know we're in a sermon series on Colossians. We're going to be continuing that series next week. But there is a word this morning that I'm eager to share at the outset of this new year from Hebrews chapter 12. I also want to let you know I'm a, a bit sad. One of my favorite uh, sermon listeners has uh, recently moved out of state. You may have known or heard Charles. Charles was the brother who sat somewhere back around here. And he uh, recently, for his job, relocated to California. He was a faithful brother who loved God's word and let the church know it. And uh, through, his, through his vocal yes and amens. And his, his vocal interaction with the preaching was such an encouragement to me. And I told him before he left that I hope he rubbed off on the congregation just a little bit. It's my desire. There you go. Yeah, you know what that means. I didn't, I didn't tell you to do anything. I just told you what I said to him. I'd like to invite you to please stand for the reading of God's word. Hebrews 12 verses 1 through 3. As is so often the case uh, in a church that practices the gifts of the Spirit, we believe that the full gifts of the Spirit are for today, including the gift of prophecy, not on the same level as Scripture, but to be tested by the Scripture. So the word that we heard earlier was a prophetic word from Colossians 1, speaking to our endurance, our need for endurance, and those who may be weary or faint-hearted in that race, as is so often the case in a charismatic church, my sermon is often preached through the prophetic words that we receive on a Sunday morning. And I thank God for that because it's a confirmation that the Spirit of God is eager to meet with us and speak to us personally today. This is Hebrews 12. I will read verses 1 through 3. This is God's holy and authoritative word. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Father, we ask that you would... Meet with us here at the outset of this year. In particular, we pray for those who are weary and faint-hearted. Lord, each one of us stand in need of your strengthening power to endure throughout this year and beyond. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. One of the iconic movie scenes that I remember from my childhood is that magnificent opening sequence to the movie Chariots of Fire. Uh, you may be familiar with it. You have the instrumental theme song, a group of athletes running on the beach, slow motion, uh, start with a splash of bare feet and then pan out, men dressed in all white with sand splattered on their shirts as they run. Uh, the movie as many of you know, tells the remarkable and famed story of Eric Little, uh, the flying Scotsman, as he was known, who ran and won uh, an Olympic gold medal in Paris in 1924, the Olympics, and he did so under extraordinary circumstances. He refused to compete on Sundays, and he nobly held to that conviction with all the determination of Chick-fil-A, and he ended up winning gold in an event that wasn't his best event. Little was a joyful man who spoke with a charming Scottish brogue. He was a brother in Christ whose life and whose character was even more impressive than his athletic gifts. He was a man of fortitude and integrity and courage. Uh, there's another scene in that movie that has always stuck with me. It's uh, 
It's a scene that's created to capture something of Little's tenacity in the face of adversity. Uh, it's when Little's running a race in Scotland and going into the first turn, another runner elbows him and he falls into the infield. He's there on the ground. He sits there for a moment. And the man officiating the race says, get up, lad, get up. Uh, this call for him to get up and to run. And so Little suddenly gets up and continues on, now running with even more determination and speed. Because sometimes the setbacks make you even more determined. And so there he is, heart racing, feet pounding, muscles burning, arms flailing. Little passes each one of the runners one by one and eventually wins the race. Uh, Hebrews 12, the verses we just read, portray the Christian life as a great race. Uh, the writers of the New Testament uh, were familiar with the Olympic Games that were held 500 years earlier in, Gr in Greece. So those, those Olympic Games would have included not only wrestling and boxing, but also a long-distance race uh, that was held in a stadium. There were sprints as well, but the imagery in these verses is of a long-distance race, a marathon, in which endurance is required. And as we enter into a new year, we need endurance, don't we? We need endurance because the race of life is long, and it is far from easy. We saw in verse 3, it talks about growing weary and faint-hearted. Friends, those are experiences that come to us all. You may look at the most mature Christian who seems to always be strong, who seems to never be failing. All of us know what it is to grow weary and to grow faint-hearted. And you may be at a place where you find yourself just thinking and wondering whether you can go on, feeling like you are just too tired. Tired of our own sin, tired of setbacks and discouragements, tired of uh, the many demands and responsibilities in life. Maybe it's the case that you've had an especially difficult year in 2019. Uh, or it could be that the past week or the past month has been uh, particularly challenging for you. It is so kind of God to meet us in his word. And I believe it's the heart of God and his desire for us to be strengthened with endurance through this passage for the new year. That is, I believe, what the Spirit of God is doing in our lives this day, giving us fresh faith, giving us new strength, giving us endurance that we might run the race that is set before us. The Lord's desire for us is in fact expressed later in this chapter, Hebrews 12, verses 12 and 13, which draw from the prophetic imagery in Isaiah 35, where it says, therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. Are anyone's hands drooping today? Are anyone's knees weak? Do you find yourself tired and weary in the race? I thank God that there is a strengthening for the people of God. That God is a God who delights to pour out His strength in us that we might live as he has called us to live. There is a race that is set before us. Did you know that? There is a race set before us as a people, Covenant Fellowship Church. God has brought us together in his kindness and has set before us the race we now run. That, that plural, let us run, is a reminder that we are not running this race together. Christian, don't Try to live the Christian life on your own. It is not let me run, it's let us run. 
You want to run this race with brothers and sisters by your side. That's what the local church is all about. We need community. We need brothers and sisters in our lives. Endurance is not an individualistic enterprise. If we are to endure, we need each other, and we need each other more now than ever. Let us together run with endurance. As we run this race, we're told we need to remember those who have gone before us. So verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. This is referring to the saints that were mentioned in the previous chapter, Hebrews 11. Abraham left his homeland. Sarah believed God is faithful even to old age. Moses considered the reproach of Christ a greater treasure than that good life of Egyptian comforts. Gideon was made stronger as his army was made weaker and smaller. Rahab risked her life. The people crossed the Red Sea. The prophets were stoned. David conquered kingdoms. On and on stories of the people of God that stand as testimonies to the faithfulness of God. Their lives testify to the reality that God is a God who is faithful in his character. And these saints surround us in the amphitheater of salvation history as heaven is cheering us on as we run this race. The better acquainted you are with the Old Testament, let this stand as an encouragement as you maybe setting out on a new Bible reading plan and you're jumping into the Old Testament, the better acquainted we are with the Old Testament, the louder we will hear that crowd roar as we run and the more encouraged we will be. They shout, God is faithful. They shout, His promises are true. They are not silent, but testify to the glorious truth that though the people of God often faint and fail, yet by faith, we shall endure. We will endure, and they testify to it. And so let every weak, let every weary and exhausted soul here today take comfort in knowing that we are not the first to run this race. There are others who have gone before. J.C. Ryle says this, the writer of Hebrews calls upon us to remember them, the saints who have gone before, and their troubles, and take courage. Are we frail earthen vessels? So were they. Are we weak and encompassed with infirmities? So were they. Are we exposed to temptation and burdened with this body of corruption? So were they. Are we afflicted? So were they. Are we alone in our generation, the scorn of all our neighbors? So were they. Have we trials and cruel mockings? So had they. Rael says, what can we possibly be called upon to suffer which they have not endured? And he says, take courage, fainting Christians. You are encompassed with a great cloud of witnesses. The race that you are running has been run by millions before. (laughs) You think that no one ever had such trials as yourself. But every step that you are journeying has been safely trod by others. The valley of the shadow of death has been securely passed by a cloud of trembling, doubting ones like yourself. They had their fears and anxieties like you. But they were not cast away. The world, the flesh, and the devil can never overwhelm the weakest person who will set their face toward God. These millions journeyed on in bitterness and tears like your own, and yet not one did perish. They all reached home. This is the testimony of the saints who have gone before us. They ran this race, they finished the course, not one did perish, they all reached home. 
The same trials that you now face, the same obstacles that stand before you, they faced them and through faith in God, by setting their faces to him, they triumphed over the world, the flesh, and the devil. We join with those saints of old. This is what our lives are about. We are joining with them, setting our faces toward God, knowing because he is faithful, we too will be brought safely home. This is the future God has for us. We learn, and you can see this if you read Hebrews 11. If you're unfamiliar with it, I encourage you to read it perhaps later today or sometime this week. You see in that chapter that some of those who have gone before were mighty in war. Others were mocked and mistreated. Uh, Some were victors and some were victims. Some abounded and some were abased. Now here's, here's a hard saying. It's not ours to choose whether the legacy of our faith will be triumph or tribulation. You don't get to choose. We say, ah, yeah, I'd like to sign up for conquering kingdoms, shutting the mouths of lions, and quenching the power of fire. And God, in his great love for us, says, you, my precious child, will be among those who are mocked and mistreated, those who are destitute and afflicted, flogged, imprisoned, slandered, stoned, and sawn in two. More than a few of those who are in the faith hall of fame of Hebrews 11 were during their lifetimes part of the hall of shame. And yet even these great saints who endured so much by way of trial and suffering, they were commended by God and God is not ashamed to be called their God. They were in fact rejected by the world because they are those of whom the world is not worthy. This world is not their home and they knew it. And though they suffered greatly, God did not abandon them and their faith was not in vain. And Christian, you can know today with absolute certainty, God will not abandon you. God is with you as he was with his saints of old. Endurance through hardship is the triumph of our faith. Your steadfastness as you finish the end of what may have been a difficult year and set out on what may be an even more difficult year, your steadfastness through it all is itself a victory and a testimony to the power of faith in Christ. What else can explain the fact that we endure but that Christ is with us and that Christ is strengthening us? Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we are told, verse 1, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. We, We not only lay aside sin, we lay aside every weight. You are allowed to run the race in a suit of metal armor or an inflatable T-Rex costume, but it's not a good idea if you want your best time, if you want to be wise about how you run the race. You need to lay aside every weight and lay aside every sin. Listen, do you know what trips me up most and hinders me most in the race? Not other people. (laughs) It's not other people. It's not my circumstances. It's my own sin. I care too much about what others think of me. I am too easily discouraged by criticism because I am proud. When people are self-righteous, I am quick to view them with my own self-righteousness. Even as believers, sin clings closely. It clings closely because it works from within. Now, there's good news in this command. To you who would look at your sin and quickly grow discouraged, the good news of this command to lay aside sin is that by the power of the Spirit, we are able to say no to ungodliness. We are able to put off sin. Though the, though the presence of sin has not been entirely removed from our lives, its penalty has been removed and its power 
has been broken because of Christ. Therefore, we are able, in the strength that he supplies, to lay aside sin. Growth is possible. Change is possible. To lay aside sin means, as Hebrews 12 later says, that we strive for peace with everyone and that we strive for holiness. It means, here's what it means to lay aside sin. It means we need to lay aside our unbelief in God's goodness. We must refuse to doubt his heart of love for us. It means we lay aside pride in the ways that we are different from others. We lay aside all lovelessness. We lay aside all lack of gentleness. We are kind to everyone. We patiently endure evil. We see to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. We lay aside sexual immorality. We lay aside the love of money. We lay aside the fear of man. All of that is Hebrews 12 and 13. We lay aside every weight, lay aside every sin, and run. And I thank God that we are told in verse 2 where to look as we run. I'm afraid that some pastors preach and minister and counsel as if the text says, let us run looking to our sin, because they always seem to be talking about our corruption and aiming at the one goal of producing a greater sense of guilt. As we run the race, where do we fix our eyes? Our eyes are not fixed on our sin or even on the cloud of witnesses, ultimately. Where do we fix our eyes? Where What will we fill our hearts and our minds with as we are running the race set before us? Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking where? To Jesus. Looking to Jesus. To everyone who finds themselves in need of power to endure, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let the Lord Jesus Christ and all his excellency captivate your heart and your attention once again. Here is your help in time of need. God can help. Here it is. This is the best counsel that can ever be given. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Seeing Jesus through the eyes of faith is all we need to be strengthened in the race we now run. Do you long to see more of Christ? Do you long to know more of him? One thing I have asked of the Lord, to gaze upon his beauty. Look to him. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Look to him. Look to him. He partook of flesh and blood that through death he might destroy the devil and deliver us from sin and death. That by the grace of God, Hebrews 2, he might taste death for everyone. Look to him. We look to the one who, after making purification for sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. See Jesus. See Jesus crowned with glory and honor. See Jesus forever living to intercede for us. There is no one like him. I thank God that Jesus is a friend of sinners. Otherwise, there is no possible way he would be a friend to me. He is the glorious Christ. He is the one who to whom none can compare. There is no one like him. A merciful and faithful high priest, the mediator of the new covenant, the great shepherd of the sheep, the sure and steadfast anchor of our souls. Look to him. Look to him. May it be our anthem today and throughout this year is look to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. We're going to do something this year totally unoriginal, And make Jesus our consuming passion. Make Jesus our obsession. 
all the sermons in all of the world cannot convey the riches of the Savior. This gospel, this Christ, is everything to us. He is our treasure. He is our endurance. He is our comfort and our hope and our joy. Look to him. And when you have looked at him, continue and go on searching, mining the depths of his love for you, the glory of his person, the riches of his character. There is no one like him. This is why we are studying Colossians together. This is the goal of our devotions and everything we do in our spiritual disciplines. This is the goal of our fasting and our prayer this week. It needs to be plain to others. This is, this is what we are about as a church. And this is what you need to be about as a Christian. It needs to be plain to others that your consuming passion is Christ and him crucified. In 2020, resolve that you won't get worked up about the wrong things. We, we fix our eyes not on changing cultural trends, not on news headlines, not on politics, not on health fads and hot topics. No, we are looking, resolutely looking to the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm telling you, the best thing you can do for your soul this year is deepen your Christology, your doctrine of Christ. Go deeper there. Resolve to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3, 18. We run this race looking to Jesus. And we are told about who this Christ is. Verse 2, he is the founder and perfecter of our faith. <laughs> oh, this is good news. He is the pioneer, the exemplar of the faith. And he is the one who initiates and completes our faith. It's who he is. Jesus has promised that he will complete the work he began in you. That doesn't depend on your feelings. That doesn't depend on your resolve. It depends on the promise of Christ our Savior. Friends, you're going to reach the finish line. You will finish the race. And every day we are one day closer. We are indeed almost home. And on that day that is coming, when the one who pioneered our faith perfects our faith, on that day we will see more clearly than ever before how every trial that has tested us was refining our faith a faith more precious than gold. And we will see on that day more clearly than ever how every setback in the race and every loss and grief in the race was making the perfection of our faith all the more glorious. He is the founder and perfecter of our faith. Verse 2 then says that Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. He endured it. So when you think about your endurance, don't give that as much attention as you give the endurance of Christ. Because it is by looking to his endurance that we endure. There is no endurance like the endurance of the Son of God. Jesus endured. Forty days of temptation in the wilderness, he endured. Satan opposed him, the crowds rejected him, the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head, but still he endured. His soul was troubled in Gethsemane, and yet he pressed on with invincible courage. Heaven's champion was running the race set before him. And nowhere do we see his unwavering fortitude more gloriously displayed than when he endured the cross. 
where he bore the wrath of God against sin and secured for us this great salvation. He did it for the joy that was set before him. He looked to the future and saw something better is coming. He looked through crucifixion to his exaltation at the right hand of the throne of God and he looked forward to the salvation of his people which is the prize for which he died. Our endurance every day comes from remembering the endurance of Jesus at Calvary. This is how we endure. Verse 3 says we are to consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Oh, friend, have you experienced opposition from others? Have you experienced hostility from others? You who have been wronged by others, have you considered the hostility our Savior endured for sinners? Verse 2 speaks of the shame of the cross. He took not only our sin, he took our shame. He was insulted. He was misunderstood. He was slandered again and again. He was mistreated by religious leaders, abandoned by his friends. He was betrayed and sentenced to death. His reputation was ruined. He was unjustly accused. He was mocked and flogged, stripped naked, and publicly crucified. There is no shame like the shame of the Son of God at Calvary, bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place, condemned, he stood. What did our master do in the face of Such great shame. Verse 2 says, he despised the shame. (laughs) He despised it. Uh, Jesus said, shame, you have no mastery over me. Shame, I will not be distracted or controlled by you. He considered the great shame, even of the cross, as nothing, for he knew the joy and the vindication and the honor that awaited him when he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you realize the gospel speaks to our shame? The gospel speaks powerfully to our shame. The gospel speaks to the deep pain of rejection and dishonor and failure. The gospel speaks to the experience of being damaged and marginalized and scorned. The the original audience of Hebrews knew the weight of shame. In Hebrews 10, verses 32 through 33, it says, You endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. So many in our world today are hurting and know what it is to experience shame and long to be rid of their disgrace. There are those who have been mistreated and abused, kids who have been mocked and bullied, those who have been slandered and maligned, those who are marginalized and oppressed and defiled and neglected. To one degree or another, we all carry shame, and at times it can be absolutely paralyzing. It can be life-dominating. It is a good word from the Lord that he has not left us to ourselves. He promises to do something about shame. Jesus is our compassionate elder brother, who identifies with his people in our shame and is not ashamed to call us brothers. Have you been mistreated? So was Christ. Are you lonely and isolated? So was Christ. Have you experienced injustice? So did Christ. Are you the object of reproach? So was Christ. 
he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53, verse 3. And because he experienced hardship and suffering and shame and endured through it all, the good news is that we, brothers and sisters, are able to do the same. We will not be defined by our suffering, but by the triumph of our endurance through faith in Christ. Charles Simeon is known for being a pastor who endured decades of difficulty and opposition. He pastored a church in Cambridge, England for 54 years. He knew uh, much hardship throughout his life. Over the first 12 years, there was, this is remarkable, there was so much opposition from his congregation. I read stories like this, and I'm just reminded of how good I have it. Um, 12 years from his congregation, people locked the pews and stayed away from the church, and they refused to let him be the, the teacher in the, the Sunday evening service. The students at the nearby university, Cambridge University, despised him. He was slandered with rumors and insults. He was a man who knew hardship. In April of 1831, Charles Simeon was 71 years old, and one afternoon in Cambridge, uh, his friend Joseph Gurney asked him how he had surmounted opposition and outlasted long-standing prejudice against him. And Simeon said to his friend Joseph, he said this, My dear brother, we must not mind a little suffering for Christ's sake. When I am getting through a hedge, if my head and shoulders are safely through, I can bear the prickling of my legs. He says, let us rejoice in the remembrance that our holy head, Christ, our holy head, has surmounted all his suffering and triumphed over death. Let us follow him patiently. We shall soon be partakers of his victory. Friends, let's not mind a little suffering. Let's remember that Jesus ran this race before us. Hasn't the gospel taught us that now is the suffering and soon will come the victory? That now is the cross and soon will come the crown. For we know that Jesus, having endured the cross, has gone before us and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And when he returns, we will, brothers and sisters, reign with him forever. Being united to Christ by faith, we too will move from suffering to glory and from dishonor to honor and from shame to vindication and from death to eternal life. Consider him. Consider him who endured from sinners such great hostility against himself. Why? So that you, so that I may not grow weary or faint-hearted. As we enter a new year, as we look forward to the year ahead, here's what I'm aware of. Oh, how we need Jesus every day in this race. We, need, we are desperate for Christ. Apart from him and his sustaining grace, apart from his power in our lives, we will grow weary and faint-hearted. And yet we have this sure confidence that by faith, by Christ, we will endure. We are weak, every one of us, yes. But I thank God that Christ is strong. Endurance, endurance ultimately is not the fruit of our resolve. It is the power of Christ in us. He is at work in us. He is not finished with his work. And therefore, we press on. We, we plow through. We keep going against all odds. Not as a testimony to our incredible stamina. Not as a statement of how great and strong we are. But as a testimony, gloriously so, to the power and the faithfulness and the glory of Jesus Christ. 
Our lives will stand, our endurance will stand as testimonies to the faithfulness of the God who has saved us. And we will look back on that final day and declare as the people of God, you have been faithful. Your promises have been true. And allow that day now, Christian, to inform the way that you run. Let those who are weak be made strong in the strength that God supplies. Run with endurance. Run with fresh faith. Run with the confidence of knowing that heaven cheers you on and that we are almost home. Christ is with us. We fix our eyes on him. Let us run with endurance. As I'm telling you, as we look to a new year, I find myself excited. I'm excited and I anticipate how God's going to meet us in our study of Colossians, even as we seek his face through prayer and fasting, prayer following this sermon here today, and prayer and fasting this week. God is eager to meet us. And so there should be a sense of collective expectancy that we have at the outset of this year, knowing that God's goodness and mercy will follow us every day throughout this year. Knowing that he is eager to strengthen us, to help us, to meet us, to give us the grace to endure. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us together, as the people of God, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, always looking to Jesus. And let's do it for the glory of God alone. Amen.